Maybe that's why Volkswagen people are always so happy. They're slightly high. So as you can tell, where this jack is located, it's part of the structural integrity of the car. This is a good point to jack from. You're not gonna damage anything and it's really strong. I'm using a motorcycle jack. Now, I'm probably gonna get some sort of flag for that for sure, but it's rated for 1,500 pounds and the whole car only weighs 1,700 pounds, so we are definitely well within its specifications. Additionally, it has a safety. So this little lever here is a safety. I need to remove this hubcap to access the bolt so I can take the tire off so I can access the valve cover so I can get to the valves. It's quite the process, but believe it or not, this is actually one of the most simple processes I've ever seen. There's a special tool required to pull these hubcaps off. Now, I don't have this special tool, so I decided to use an Allen wrench. And so what we did here is we put the Allen wrench inside this hole, and what happens is right on the inside there where the Allen wrench goes through, it lines up with this ridge here. And once you put those in there, all you need to do is gently push and a hubcap will come flying right off. I just learned that today. There's something beautiful about powerful impact gun. So much easier. And so much heavier. That thing's heavy. Okay, now we have access. <laughs> the gimbal's leaning, leaning like this. But the camera's straight. <laughs> now we have more access to the valve train. I really want to quiet this motor down, so I need to adjust the valves first. So now what we need to do is get the engine in top dead center. There's a few different things we need to do. First thing is, determine which wire is pointing at number one cylinder. Number one cylinder is on the passenger side in the front, so that's gonna be over there. There are way too many zip ties. I'm going to have to cut them off. I mean, I guess that's pretty common for a Beetle. It's usually held together with duct tape and bailing wire, but this guy implemented zip ties. The reason why I want to pull the part... <laughs> the reason why I want to take the zip ties off the spark plug wires is so that I can tell which spark plug wire is which by pulling on it. As it is now, since they're zip tied together, I don't know which one is which. So I need to get them disconnected, then I can pull on it, find out which spark plug wire is which, and then determine which cylinder is number one on the distributor cap. Sweet! So now I can pull on this number one spark plug wire, and I know with a modicum of certainty that it is the spark plug wire sitting at five o'clock, which would be the one pointing at me right now. Now I need to pull the cap off and rotate the motor until it points to number one which is going to be at five o'clock on the distributor if you're looking at it as a clock. Then I need to find out where the marks are on the pulley and hopefully the marks line up to top dead center. Okay, so the distributor is pointing at about seven o'clock or maybe eight. So that's not where we want it. We want it pointing at around five, which is right here. So now we know that the distributor is pointing at the number one cylinder. Now that we know that, we need to go find out if it is in fact the number one. I'm guessing it is, but in order to find out for sure, we need to pull off the valve cover. Okay, so some people just put a screwdriver here and pry down, but I want to get in the practice of not scratching whatever I'm working on, so I'm going to try just using a piece of cloth. If you guys are familiar with the master cylinder, this kind of looks like the top of a master cylinder cover. Look at that. Worked beautifully. Like a glove. I should have bought gloves the last time I was at my favorite place. That's number one, and it is not in the right place. So we are 180 degrees off. Okay, as you may have noticed, this valve was rocking back and forth. That was because I was rotating the engine before and after top dead center. So I was watching the video feed from above while I was rotating the engine. So now we know that it is top dead center. One, this one is rocking, which means we're on top dead center. I validated because there's a notch on the pulley that's lined up to the center of the block, which I'll show you here shortly. And so now we know that the engine is now at top dead center. So we have a feeler gauge here. It's set at six thousandths. So that's the feeler gauge I'm using. It's that, so if you're not familiar, that is .006. Okay, so we're gonna check to see how loose these are. I would say that is not loose. In fact, that is really, really tight. Oh my goodness, how is that so tight? Both of those are exceptionally tight. 
that's about perfect. Now when you do this, you kind of have to put the screwdriver in, and I'm going to screw this down with a nut, so I'm going to have to almost push counterclockwise a little bit with the screwdriver to keep the position correct. Now let's double check. We've got a little bit of friction there, that's just what we want. Perfect. These guys are ready. Let's check them out. Perfect. If you mark your crankshaft opposite of the top dead center mark, then when you rotate the engine backward, half a turn, so where the opposite of the top dead center line is marked up with top dead center, then you're on number two. If the engine wants to roll back from where you want it to sit, just roll it a little further and it, what it's doing is it's moving the air. It's decompressioning basically. So just keep working with it. You can get it to stop right where you want it to. So we started at top dead center and we adjusted the valves on number one cylinder. Then we wanted to adjust the valves on number two cylinder. So we rotated the engine counterclockwise until the mark way down there was pointing at the same place, at this notch. And so then we knew that we were on two. So now we rotated it another half turn counterclockwise until we're back at top dead center. And the distributor is pointed at this spark plug wire, which if you run it back, goes all the way back to the driver's side front. So that's the cylinder we're going to adjust the valves on next. I've never adjusted valves before, so this is my first time doing it. Right now we're on the driver's side. I practiced on the passenger side, so let's see if we can show you what I've learned. Just give us one big tug here. There we go. Let's pull this guy off here. Oh, there we go. Now I have a box underneath this so that when I pull this cover off, if any oil leaks out, it'll be captured in my cardboard box. It's garbage. So. I do recommend gloves. Nasty. We got some oil spillage. Exxon, where are you at, Mr. Valdez? Okay, you need three tools to do this valve adjustment. You need a 13 millimeter box end wrench. You need a screwdriver. And then you also need a feeler gauge. So I'm gonna feel behind here, and that is perfect as well. So those two valves are adjusted correctly. This is not making me happy. <laughs> this thing rattles like a can of jawbreakers at the bowling alley. Let's rotate the engine so that we can look at this cylinder here. All right, so now both of these should be loose. They are. Let's check the gap. That's correct. And it's the last one here. That is slightly tight. I don't like that, so I'm going to adjust that one for sure. Now I do not know the proper torque for these nuts. If you do, please drop a comment in the comment section below so I will know what I should be torquing these down to. Now that one's proper. This is a really simple process. I had no idea it would be that easy. Now that I know what I'm doing, I can do an entire valve adjustment in no more than 15 minutes. It's pretty cool. I'm glad they designed it this way so you will actually do the maintenance you need to do. The final step is putting the valve cover back on. Now, I don't have any new gaskets, so this is probably going to leak like crazy now, but it was already leaking pretty good to begin with. There we go. <laughs> that was by far the easiest thing to do on a car that is so in depth. <laughs> Pulling that valve cover off and on, oh my goodness, it's so easy. It's literally a spring holding the valve cover together. <laughs> oh man, that's great. On a side note, let's take a look at the heater boxes and explain how heaters work in a Volkswagen. Since we're already here, we may as well learn about that a little bit more, shall we? All right, you guys ready to learn how heaters work in Volkswagens? It's pretty complicated. This is the exhaust manifold coming straight off the head. That exhaust manifold is exceptionally hot. That hot pipe runs through this box, exits through the heater box, out through this pipe, right into the muffler. Now, so the air is flowing this direction, from the front to the back. Conversely, the fan is blowing cold air through here, into this heater box, through this pipe here. Now this pipe here takes the hot air 
and blows it into the cabin of the bug. There are two valves between the seats in the bug that determine if you should have hot air and where that air should be directed. One of them is just an air direction valve. The one that turns the heater on and off is going to this valve. On both sides, there's this valve. And this valve is basically just a flapper valve that is either on, which would allow air to flow, or it turns off and it would stop the air from flowing. That's how the heaters work in a bug and a bus, and a Gia, and a thing, and all of them. That's the standard Volkswagen heater system. Now, there are other gasoline heaters, and we're not gonna get into that, but that's the standard air-cooled heating system. There can be a few problems with those systems, one of which, this pipe can just come off. If that pipe comes off, of course, you don't have heat. The other can be that this heater box becomes rusted. Now, here's a point of caution. If you smell exhaust when you turn your heater on, it's most likely due to an exhaust manifold leak or the pipe running through the heater box has a leak. That could be a reason why you're getting exhaust smell in your car when you turn your heater on. Now, if the pipe is connected, the valve is adjusted, and you're still not getting heat, that's probably because your heater box is rusted out. Especially on the east coast where they salt the roads, you can imagine that heater box is right toward the bottom. It's going to get a lot of salt. It's going to get a lot of road grind. So always inspect your heater boxes and your exhaust manifolds. Make sure there's no cracks. This is more important in an air-cooled engine like a bug or a bus than it is in a normal car because in a normal car, you just have exhaust leak that would filter in through the cabin, which is not good, but with this design, if there's an exhaust leak, it's literally going to blow that exhaust straight into the cabin. <laughs> So we don't want to be asphyxiated driving Volkswagen bugs. Maybe that's why Volkswagen people are always so happy. They're slightly high. So that pipe that was taking that cool air into the heater box, that's this pipe here. So this is where the cold air gets blown into the heater box. Now, sometimes you'll see bugs where they've capped this off. And that's probably because their valve isn't working and they don't want to get heat blown into their cabin all the time. That's my guess. If I'm wrong about that, if there's another reason, please let me know, but that's my understanding of it. So if your heat's not working, first step, check this. Make sure this is actually connected. The fan, the fan is pretty cool, actually. The fan that warms up the cabin, it's the same fan that cools the engine. And that fan is located on the other side of this alternator, or generator, depending on which one you have. So your crank pulley here turns a belt that turns your alternator generator, which charges the battery and provides electricity to the engine, it also is a double agent, 007. Its mission, when it chooses to accept it, is to not only charge the battery, but also cool the engine. So let's take a look at how that happens. This poor little bug keeps getting flat tires. I pump them up, but they just keep going flat within a day. Okay, so this is that device I was telling you about, either an alternator or a generator, depending on what you have. The pulley would be attached here and would be spun from the crank. On the other side, there's a huge fan! And so this fan spins and provides cooling to the engine. Okay, you say, that's well and good. There's a big fan, like a squirrel cage, but where the heck or how the heck does it get there? Glad you asked. This bug engine looks terrible because it needs a new generator and it probably needs a whole lot of other things. But here's how the cooling system works. This is what it looks like with the generator out. So as you can see, this is where the generator would go. This is where the pulley would be. And right here is where that big fan would go. If we look down in there, you can actually see the cooling fins to the cylinder and the cylinder head. This is just a big cooling shroud. So it's gonna take that fan, that air, and it's gonna push it around the cylinder heads. And it also has these little spouts that is used to push into the heater box I showed you earlier to warm up the cabin. It's pretty cool how this works, isn't it? It's really simplistic, but it's pretty awesome. Where does the air come from? These little vents on the top have vents on the underside, which direct the air to the back side of this box, which is the intake of the air for the engine. As you can see, this would be the air intake where it comes in through that fan that I showed you earlier. And the air gets spun up, pushed down through to the cooling fins of the cylinder and the cylinder head. This is why it's so important when you're looking at a Volkswagen engine to make sure that the tins are there. The tins are actually very functional. They keep the engine cool. If the tins are missing, there's quite a high probability that it may have been overheated at some point. So be careful when you're looking at a bug that does not have its cooling tins on there. Perfect.
awfully quiet, but it's much better. I think it would get better if I did it a couple more times and got it more accurate, but I must not have gotten those valves quite perfect yet. Well, she's really cold. <laughs> yeah!